All right, our next concept is called workhorse shapes. What I mean by that is that these will work in literally every jazz and blues situation where you're comping. They just always sound good. And it's always good to sound good. <laughs> it's nice to have some chord shapes that you can always rely on to sound good, regardless of whether you're playing with an organ or piano or trio, whatever the setting is, these voicings will always sound good, guaranteed. So here's the initial concept, and we're not going to worry too much about theory at all. We're just going to get into a little bit of uh, definition here, and specifically I'm talking about guide tones. So if we talk about the guide tones of any chord, we're talking about the third and the seventh, and that changes depending on what chord that you're talking about. This next etude is a blues, so we're going to be focusing a lot on dominant seventh chords. So the third and seventh of a dominant seventh chord are major third or natural third and flat seven or minor third or minor seven, excuse me, respectively. Those are our two guide tones. So if you take a look at example one, the chord symbol is B flat seven. So of course we have our B flat right there on the root six. And then we're just gonna, for now, uh, plant our guide tones on the middle two strings. So D and G strings. So we have A flat, which is the flat seven. D is the third. Play those three together and we have the basic bone structure for a dominant seventh chord. All right, so we can, we can build chords on top of that. This is where the workhorse shapes come into play. So it's just a matter of memorizing these. So at first, you know, you can do them with the root so you can hear them in context. If we look at those next two chords for B flat 13, we've got this, and then finally this, nine on top. You know, you can practice them with the root, but eventually you want to get to the point where you can uh, see and feel and hear these chords without the root right? Because the bass player is going to be playing the root anyway. So in other words, you want to recognize this, just those two guide tones, as a B-flat 7 chord. And recognize this as a B-flat 13 and a B-flat 9 13. Just kind of memorize those shapes. And if we look at the next measure, for example, one, now we've moved to the four chord of the blues. This would be E-flat 7. So we're going to build our guide tones. Still in the two middle strings. Now our root is right there on the A string. And if we expand upon these two notes, we've got nine and then E flat 13 on the top. So those are two shapes that you can use, you know, in the context of a blues. B flat 13 can go to E flat nine or B flat nine 13 can go to an E flat nine 13. So again, these are, this is an example of voice leading and, and this is a practice that um, a lot of great piano players and organists do. All right, in example two, now we're just going to take that same concept, but drop the guide tones a little lower on a one string set down. So now the guide tones, the third and seventh, will be on the A and D strings. There it is for B flat seven. Now we really have to see this uh, without playing the root. So the way I see this, by the way, is there's the B flat on the 13th fret, fifth string, right? Go down for the flat seven, and the third's above it. So there's your place of orientation. There's your dominant seventh guide tones, okay? And then we can build on top of that, 13 and 13 nine. I really like using this middle string set because it sounds nice and fat. Uh, you know, a great example of somebody that played these types of voicings was Stevie Ray Vaughan. Even though he's playing in a blues context, he played a lot of these tunes, you know, with nines and thirteens as an extension. And it made his trio sound really full. I mean, even when it's just guitar played on a Strat, he would really, you know, make the sound so big because he would use these fat voicings kind of like on the middle string sets higher up the neck. Um, so if we look at the second measure of example two, now our guide tones just move down to E flat seven, 10 and 11th fret, and then we have the fingerings for nine and 13. So again, our B flat seven to E flat movement is, or with three notes, or finally three notes, or four notes total. So those are shapes that you can just spend a few minutes, uh, you know, kind of playing around with, moving them around to different chord roots and, uh, and just starting to memorize those. All right, so in example three, this is something, this is just uh, an example of a classic move. So everyone has, you know, different comping vocabulary. And, uh, you know, some of my favorite compers, uh, you know, include Jim Hall, 
Ed Bickert, the great Canadian guitarist. Uh, Joe Pass in quartet settings. You know, check out that record, Dizzy's Big Four, uh, when, when Joe's doing a lot of great comping on that. There's these moves that they all do, and it's just basically a way to connect these chords, whether you're playing blues or a jazz standard or anything. So um, let's just... Let's just play through example three real quick and you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. So something like one, two, three, four. So that's all part of the A2 that we're gonna check out. Um, but it's just an idea of some things that you can use uh, or some ideas that you can use using these basic workhorse shapes. So again, don't worry about analyzing every note on the chord and saying, you know, where's the ninth, where's the thirteenth? Don't worry about that. Just memorize these shapes. So we've got our B flat 13, little chromatic approach. And then just some little moves like with a 2-5. 13. That's a classic Joe Pass move. So those are all moves that you can use over an E flat 7 chord. Looking down to example four, here's another technique that a lot of great compers use a lot, and that's using a common tone on top. This is usually used in a turnaround, but if we look at the chords, uh, as we would see in a jazz blues progression, the B flat would then be moving down to the G7. This would be kind of in bar eight leading up to the last four bars. So a lot of times people will do a chromatic turnaround, B flat, A7, A flat seven to G7. And um, what a lot of great compers would do is keep this B flat on top. So you've got these different chords moving while the B flat's on top. So you've got a B flat 13, and then A 13 with a B flat on top, that would be a flat nine. A flat 13, and then G7 altered. And that's really nice with any kind of a rhythm because you have that, that common tone is like the glue that's holding all those chords together. That's something else you can use in a shout chorus. Moving on to example five, um, this idea is called rhythms and repetition. So speaking of shout chorus, this is something that Wes Montgomery was just amazing at. He would just create such excitement in his comping and in his chord soloing by just using repetition. And so what's going on here is that we have this nice kind of blues rhythm here happening right at the top of example five, the chord is E flat nine. So we're using our middle string set and then we're jumping up to the top four strings. So it's just kind of bouncing back and forth between those two shapes. And we've got this nice kind of blues syncopated rhythm. So the rhythm is a and we're just gonna replicate that. And what that does is create almost kind of like a riff sound, you know, throughout the changes. And it's a great way to build up some excitement. So all we have to do is just modif use the same rhythms, but modify our chords. So here's an example that we'll see in our A2, but here it is right now, example five. A one, two, three, and. D minor seven, G seven alt, C minor. F7. So you can really, you know, create a lot of excitement by just, you know, repeating a figure over and over again and using these shapes to capture the changes. This is something that if you start doing, the drummer will go along with you and maybe the bassist will accent. And this is where a lot of the magic can start to happen when you're playing live. 